Esos son los diálogos mesilas. Welcome to this Mesila podcast. My name is Ajay Gandhi. I'm an anthropologist and assistant professor at Leiden University in the Netherlands. Today I'm speaking with another anthropologist, Maria Jose de Abreu, an assistant professor of anthropology at Columbia University in New York. We're speaking about her recent book, The Charismatic Gymnasium, published by Duke University Press in 2021. It examines a Catholic evangelical movement the Charismatics, which come to have prominence in the 1990s. Maria Jose tracks how this movement comes to forge a prominent place in the Brazilian public sphere, how it mobilizes notions of breath and the regulation of one's body, as well as the electronic media to come to have a certain stance on economic and political life. I hope you enjoy the podcast. So thank you, uh, Maria Jose, for coming and speaking to me today. Maybe we can begin by discussing your book, your recent book, The Charismatic Gymnasium. It looks at a Catholic evangelical movement um, called the Charismatics, which you describe as emerging in the 1990s in Brazil, and then um, as intersecting with Brazil's own engagement with global capitalism. So maybe we can just begin by you sort of describing a little bit about the charismatics, how they operate and why they're important to look at. Well, indeed, my focus in this book is dedicated to thinking the role of the charismatic movement in the 90s, which is the moment that they really become very popular and very central in characterizing Catholicism in Brazil. It is important to refer that this movement, religious movement, first comes to Brazil in 1969. And it's a movement that actually is imported from the United States to Brazil. It is brought by two American Jesuits who have experienced this integration into the charismatic movement back in the U.S., uh, in places like uh, uh, Arkansas and who come to Brazil with two very different orientations. These two American Jesuits are Father Haroldo Ram, who has a very strong orientation towards the poor and to deal with the drug addicts. And, and so he wants to bring these teachings of charismatic renewal, this charismatic movement that first appears in America but to work with the poor and the drug addicts. Um, and then there is this other American Jesuit, Father Eduardo Dougherty, who wants to apply this charismatic movement to the use of new mass media technologies. While they both rely on these doctrines of the Holy Spirit, so they are Catholics, but they really think that the Catholic Church needs to become more spiritually engaged, and to invite more the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, into Catholicism, which is something that people normally associated with Protestant uh, uh, Pentecostals. And so this is the Catholic Church saying, you know, we also need to spiritualize the Catholic Church more. And so these two uh, figures, they have these very different orientations, but it's mostly father, this father, Eduardo Dougherty, who wants to use mass media and combine this turn to spirituality with new media technologies, and thus to bring a form of televangelism into the Catholic Church. So something that normally was associated with Protestant Pentecostalism, he wants to, to bring it to, into the Catholic Church. And he comes to Brazil with that intention. And it's him that I particularly follow because I had this interest in seeing, looking at this articulation between religion and media. Now, 
the situation, although this charismatic movement that I have to say in the beginning, they, they were searching for their name. They didn't know if they call them Catholic charismatics, if they call themselves Catholic Pentecostals. So they were be also because it was very ecumenical uh, movement, right? Combining both people from Protestants uh, who have experience with Protestant Pentecostalism, but also have experience with Opus Dei, another movement called Cruzillos of Cristandade. And so it was ecum ecumenical primarily. But once the charismatic movement arrives in Brazil in 1969, there's there's a particular reality that it, you know it's not the United States, right? So they have to also adjust to the kind of forces that were there in Brazil, and that are naturally different than those in in America. And and what you have in Brazil is another expression of Catholicism that is very strong there, less so in in the United States. But it's an expression that is also the product of the Second Vatican Council that happened between 1962 and 1964. And that is liberation theology. So both liberation theology and the Catholic charismatic movement, in a way, they are products of this Second Vatican Council. But they are movements that are quite at odds with each other, particularly in Brazil, right? Because you have this movement, liberation theology, which taps into modern tendencies of a more rationalized Catholicism that in Brazil was very strong because in the latter part of the 19th century, you have all these priests coming from Europe to Brazil, Italian, German, Polish, they come to Brazil to rationalize Catholicism because actually there were very few priests. It was a big country, very few priests around, you know, in the country. And in fact, people used to say too many priests very little faith. People actually didn't want much of, um, you know, to have this more institutional power there. And there was, you know, people like in interior parts of Brazil, who people who would just, it was lay power. People would have these charismas indeed to cure, to do prophecy, you have to be a priest, you know, have a, an, an actual official status. And so these priests that come in the second part of the 19th century from Europe, it's about to control this and to rationalize Catholicism. And so, and that's when you actually create the category of popular Catholicism until the 19th century, it was just Catholicism. Now you need to call it popular Catholicism because there's an official Catholicism, which is much more rationalized. And inside that group, you have then indeed a tendency to have a much more intellectualized kind of Catholicism with indeed very strong Marxist orientations, very intellectually informed, as in expressions like this, the famous Catholic action, which is actually a movement, you know, that was very strong here in Holland and Belgium, which was priests who were working in factories, you know, and really calling attention for the poor conditions of the workers. And that also is imported to Brazil. And so it has these very strong left-wing leanings, you know, this combination of attempts at modernizing, modernizing, rationalizing Catholicism in Brazil becomes then articulated also with these more left-wing leanings. And that takes then even a stronger expression during the Second Vatican Council of 1960, 1962, 1964, but in Brazil in 1964 is also when the military dictatorship begins between 1964 and 1985. And so the progressive left-wing leanings that were there prior to that become even stronger, you know, these years because liberation theology is going to have this major role in opposing this US-backed military dictatorship. Now, the charismatics come at the same time from America you know, and so there is in, within Catholicism a very strong antagonism between these two movements, liberation theology on the one hand and the charismatics on, on the other. And it's interesting then that of all places, the charismatics that come, like I said, from the United States through this Doherty and Ram, they choose to come to Sao Paulo. But Sao Paulo it was precisely where liberation theology was the strongest. The Archdiocese of Sao Paulo was very strong, had a very charismatic liberation theology fray, 
Fray Paulo Harms, who I had the chance to interview. And they come, uh, you know, it's curious because in such a big country, you could think that they could go elsewhere, you know, and try to influence the population there. Now, they come precisely where liberation theology is very strong. But they don't come exactly to the center of Sao Paulo. They go to a place that is in the periphery, the area of so-called Campinas, but within the state of Sao Paulo. So they kind of want to be at the center, you know, but they stay a bit at the periphery. And Campinas has a strong university. It's a university town. And in the United States, the charismatics also come from among scholars, you know. The same happens in Campinas, where there's this University of Campinas. And there they would even meet inside the headquarters, you know, in, inside the university, on campus. But also in people's uh, condominiums and garages. And sometimes by nature, they would put a tent. They like tents very much. And so they were, as it were, you know, coming in, forming these prayer groups, and they were being indeed very much resisted by liberation theology, by right? who was in, in turn resisting against the regime. And the liberation theology, you know, associates these charismatics with people who support the regime, like as two products that are actually, in a way, being supported by the United States, right? There's even this expression, the demons come from the North. Everything that was coming from the United States had this kind of devilish association. But the interesting thing here is that it was actually very important for charismatics to be in this position of, you know, marginality, both geographically, you know, to be in this campinas was not to be exactly in the center, but also in the sense that um, one of the premises of, of charismatic Pentecostalism is this idea of living a second Pentecost. And so, like the first Christians were persecuted and marginalized, the fact that they were being marginalized allowed them to have this feeling that they were, you know, to authenticate their experience of being, you know, a new Pentecost, as they say, right? Pentecost was this, um, you know, after the death of Jesus, the apostles meet in this place called the Seneca. They meet there and they are in fear, you know, that they would be killed, right? And the that moment, the Holy Spirit descends in the form of a, of a rushing wind, right? And they were filled with the Spirit, and they spoke in tongues. And from that moment, you know, charismatic say Christianity began because the Holy Spirit comes to them and, and, and breaks the walls, literally, you know, also of the walls of fear. And this is the moment that the, the project of apostolic evangelization begins. Um, and so in a way to be resisted by liberation theology, you know, allowed many of these charismatics to, to actually authenticate the feeling that they were living a second Pentecost. And it's interesting that even now people have a certain nostalgia for those days because they say those days, you know, those years, you know, when we were being resisted, we could feel the real sense of the presence of the Holy Spirit amongst us, you know? Can you maybe explain a little bit how you see the success of the charismatics, given the political background you're describing, the context of um, deprivation and poverty in which an outsider might think that liberation theology would be a more, would be more successful, people would be more receptive to it. One of the interesting things about your book is how you describe the seductiveness of um, the charismatic practices of their communication practices. So can you explain a little bit how in this conflict with um, more left-leaning liberation theology, how the charismatics come to be more prominent? Yes, I think indeed the, the combination of mass media with the emphasis on the body and the emphasis also on charisma, which taps it into what we were saying before, that in pre-modernism, you know, there was this idea of charisma and the idea of a, a certain lay power uh, that was there. Because it was interesting that because sanctity or charisma was now come, being endowed by the Holy Spirit, you can see that there was, in a way, an attack of charismatics against the institution, right? It's this famous dichotomy between institution and charisma. And, and indeed, many of these charismatics were, you know, um, among the lay people who did experience this baptism in the Holy Spirit. They were telling these priests, look, you haven't even been baptized in the Holy Spirit. 
you've done your your degree, you read your theology books, but you didn't experience the Holy Spirit. So it was this interesting tension in those early days, you know, between charisma and uh, institution, which is has a very strong matrix in this pre-modern Catholicism that, uh, you know, people didn't really want priests around, you know. That's why then there was all these priests coming from Europe, you know, I was describing, you know, to to control the populations, you know, and to really stop the mysticism and all these charismas and this democratic distribution of power, you know, of, of charismatic power, you know, that had to be controlled by the Catholic Church. Do you think part of the appeal of charismatic practices in Brazil has to do with the sense that people's own relationship to the divine or to the spirit can be unmediated, that it does not need to be rationally um, circumvented through authorities or institutions or so-called rational practices. Is that part of the seductiveness of, of charismatic? Absolutely. Because that is indeed um, the discussion that was there, you know, was that, that liberation geology was using uh, methods of persuasion that were too based on referential meaning, on particular indoctrination to do with the kind of language that ultimately was more like a projection among those who so spoke, but that didn't really consider, you know, the kinds of dispositions of of the people in the name of whom they were, on behalf of whom they were speaking, you know, and debating. And so it, it was the charismatic movement saw that and they'd come forward with this discourse, you know, that if you do come to these prayer gatherings, first in the form of these prayer groups, and then, you know, in, inside these shows that were technologically mediated, you know, it was nothing like that. It was not a discursive experience, but really a form of engaging, you know, more like a sensorial of engaging the body through this idea of pluma that is the theological core of this charismatic movement. Actually, it was all about bringing your breathing and turning the, the very principle of life into a form of presence, really being there, you know, and engaging with divine uh, was a more immediate experience. So it was indeed a critique to the question of mediation. Now you need to ask yourself, since when using media technology is not using a form of mediation, but it did presuppose this idea that to use mass media, you know, it would be about honing breeding rather than actually mediating breeding, right? It was about punctuating, you know, technology is there to punctuate the natural, which is breeding, and not to mediate, right? And this is the discussion that Catholicism and Protestantism have had in the past. The Protestant Reformation happened as a critique to mediation. We don't need priests, you know, we don't need the catechism, we don't need the sacraments, right? We can speak directly with God, right? And that's the reason also why Protestantism has was so good at incorporating electronic media. Because it allows you to forget that actually what you're seeing is an image, right? Because of the promise and the fantasy of the immediacy and directness and liveliness of all. And here, breathing and liveliness and technology, that if you can actually articulate all these different things, you know, around the idea of immediacy, it's quite a powerful thing, and which they did. Maybe we can just dwell a little bit on this idea, this Greek idea that you discuss in your book of Numa, which I understand is an older vocabulary for breath, which is sort of retrieved or recuperated perhaps by the charismatics. So many people who might be listening to this would understand breath to have a physiological connotation, perhaps even a spiritual connotation that is not allied to a particular ideology or a particular institution. 
But very interestingly in your book, this category of breath becomes a way to regulate perhaps believers to also change one's own um, individuality, one's own orientation. So could you, could you maybe just dwelling a little bit on this idea of Punoma, explain why it becomes so important for the charismatics? So, so Pneuma is the Greek term for breath, air, spirit. And these three, you know, they, they are used, uh, you know, interchangeably by, by charismatics. There's several reasons why this Pneuma is important, you know, and they all articulate in very powerful way. One of them is something that has to do with the nature of Catholicism, which is all especially Orthodox Catholicism, and hence the Byzantine being very important here, which is, you know, Catholicism, Catholos, Holos means this, and which is this capacity to hide the particular behind the universal. So if you're able to pick up something that is as universalistic as breeding and mm-hmm. actually using it to work and engineer a very particular agenda. This is a, what you ought to say, it's a, a kind of formula mm-hmm. of, of Catholicism, that Catholicism, particularly the Orthodox Catholicism and Byzantine, has used in the past, right? The thing about uh, breeding is indeed that you would think what more natural expression of spontaneity could you think of other than breathing, right? And yet it's precisely that that spontaneity, you know, it's not the point of departure, actually is the arrival. It's spontaneous, it looks spontaneous, precisely because there's a structure there, right, that is organizing that spontaneity. And so charismatics for the last year invested uh, a lot in regulating the breeding of the congregation and to create this idea of a congregation that can be in sync if you manage to create uh, certain formats, um, like songs, forms of prayer, you know, that, and then you can record those songs that are actually forms of structured breeding, right? And you record and you go home and you listen to it and you do it again. What you're actually doing is organizing a certain economy of breeding and they say, you know, this, if you do this time and time and again, so repetition is very important, you are disciplining your breathing in such a way that even when you're sleeping, you're still praying, you know, so the prayer goes on, you know, beyond your intentionality, right? So it, it becomes this habitus that you tr- really train your body, you know, to breathe in a certain way such that you're Breathing becomes a constant form of prayer. You're praying all the time, you know, and to be alive is, is to be, you know, filled with this religiosity, right, in full time. But one needs to see that this focus on breathing comes at a time, particularly um, in the 1990s, when uh, we were saying before that the, the, you know, there was this dictatorship ends in I- a- 85, because the dictatorship is over, in a way, the power of liberation theology also recedes, right? Because this liberation, this significant other is no longer there. So it recedes, and then you have this neoliberal moment really coming to Brazil, you know, in the, in the mid-90s. And the politics of the third way that were uh, being suggested by Clinton and by um, Tony Blair, you know, also have a, a strong impact in Brazil. And you have this... And you see that this third way is also very good to think of the third way is the third way of the Spirit, because you have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the third. And the Spirit is precisely this agile entity, right? This It's a flexible... It's a flexible mm. entity, right? That goes very well with this third way and this moment that indeed flexibility becomes very important. I remember being in São Paulo, walking in São Paulo in this main Avenida Paulista, this main avenue, where all the banks are. And there's these ladies who are measuring, you know, your pulse to see, you know, how your heart is beating, you know, feel your heart, you know, before you enter the bank, you know, and which I think it's very emblematic of this moment, you know, that actually spas and gyms were exploding all over, 
And you have this movement then, Catholicism, which is, of course, you know, very important in a place like Brazil, turning, you know, into this pneuman, to turning into this kind of theology of breeding, really. I'm interested in the link between, you know, the way that the charismatics mobilize an individual aptitude, a, a bodily habitus around breath um, with a very particular kind of politics. And so maybe we can speak a little bit about that, because one of the fascinating aspects of your book is that this reformist um, element within uh, Catholicism in Brazil at this particular historical moment, it gets aligned with or allied to a certain way of thinking of economic growth, of national vitality. So I'm just wondering if you can speak a little bit about how do all of these elements get conjoined uh, through breath? I think that one of the important shifts that's happening around this time, it's almost a, a shift that it's epistemological. You know, Brazil for a long time, as the flag says, you know, order and progress. And even this icon, you know, that is in Rio de Janeiro with these open arms, right? Which is like an axis mundi. It's really this, also to, to thinking of a history of air, when, when we think air really has a very interesting history, you know, that the idea that once air was substance and that icon there is the moment that Brazil is saying air here is no longer substance, but dimension. So this axis moon is like, you know, a measuring that saying that air from now on is measured, you know, it's a dimension. But that moment also is a moment when, you know, this idea of Brazil, país do futuro, Brazil, the country of the future, where it was, and this notion of order, positivistic, brought from the positivists from August Kant. It was indeed uh, imagined, Brazil was imagined as a country, you know, that had to do with this you know, capacity to, to predict a certain order and a certain progress, a certain capacity to, um, or, or desire for uh, calculation where, of where things are going, you know, and towards this future. And I think in the 90s, certainly there is this realization that actually it's not so much about predicting the future as much as preparing yourself in order to adapt for unexpected changes. It's a kind of, um, it's a logic of flexibility within volatility. Yes, precisely. So, so it's about that icon that is there on top of the Corcovado mountain in Rio de Janeiro. It's mm -hmm. too stiff. It does symbolize that moment of, it was built in 1933, that, you know, under the Redenturistas, which are precisely these priests that come from Europe to Brazil to reform and to rationalize Catholicism, that these charismatics are against, you know, and they say that icon is too stiff. We need a more flexible image, you know, uh, figure. And in fact, the most famous Brazilian charismatic almost as a kind of critique, takes on an Asa Delta and goes and flies around that icon, almost as if to say, look, air is not a dimension, it's substance. Mm -hmm. I'm flying here with this Asa Delta. No? That was the closest I've seen that critique that it's there, but it's everywhere, this critique, you know, which is a, a critique to the rigidity of the Catholic Church as such. We have to turn our bodies much, you know, in much more supple. Catholicism in Brazil has become too rigid, right? Too institutionalized. Let's infuse it with charisma. Let's infuse it with spirit. Let's make these bodies more flexible. Now, this flexibility is precisely this moment when indeterminacy, you know, it's also becoming part of our current culture of temporality, you know, mm -hmm. that more and more, and now with, you know, with this moment we're living now with COVID, as we were speaking before, you know, that one thing is, we think things are going in a certain way and the next day they go all, you know. So, so the ability to shift gears, to adapt and to be poised for change, to structure indeterminacy, not only to deal with it and cope with it, but actually turn it into a generative expression of the system itself. And, and, and this is indeed what charismatics saw, you know, that this is a moment that we need, you know, to, in a way, go back to that pre-modern moment before that 
stiffening, that, that, that rigidity, you know, that, that icon that comes there with its, so pick up some of the charismas that were there and, you know, so they can also speak to the so-called popular culture that was there and combine it with this new, uh, these logics, neoliberal logics, you know, that are appearing now in the 90s in, in society at large, really. And let's not forget, indeed, that these Catholic charismatics, you know, early on, they were indeed upper class, well-educated people who very much resented liberation theology, so-called option for the poor. Since when Catholicism, Catholicism, Catholus, is about, you know, option for a certain class. This is too political, you know. Let us pick up something that can be universally experienced, right? But in fact... Again, the particular is hiding behind it, the terms of democratization and universality, you know. Because in fact, they are very much speaking the language of neoliberal capital. There's a remarkable resonance in your book with our more general languages, um, political languages, economic languages of disruption and uh, volatility with this um, almost kind of insurgent discourse from the church of of uh, flowing with things, of uh, bending oneself to circumstance. And that's, that's interesting because it seems to me that's not just prevalent in Brazil, but in many places that that is something that we are told by politicians, by CEOs, that we should be more malleable, we should be more um, accommodating, we should be more plastic. Uh, so... If they seem to have been very prescient. They seem to have really understood um, this wider set of languages that, that have come to be in our social lives. Yes. And I mean, all the way, because, you know, even in terms of uh, techniques of prayer, we were once talking about beads, you know, that they changed the rosary that you normally used in the West, which is this kind of rosary that you tell a little story, you know, and you say, Ave Maria, Shed Graso, Senhor, Como, it's, it's this little story. And they say, no, 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 put that aside, that's too many words. And it's still about, even though, you know, you're not really that much thinking about what you're saying, you know, it's still not something that actually you can use in terms of using language to actually structure your breathing. And the way to do it was to substitute that rosary by this Byzantine rosary, where you really pray, you, you, you say language, not because of its referential meaning, but you say language as a way of structuring your breathing. And mm. that's why they created this regime called the aerobics of Jesus. What is this aerobic of, aerobics of Jesus? Is the use of the Byzantine rosary, which is a Byzantine that has 10 pearls. So you repeat 10 times the same sentence, and then they use mass media and they even use you know techno music in some because techno music is all about you know the beating of the heart and it has that universal feeling because anyone knows how to dance on techno music right mm. whatever you do you fit mm. right and that idea of being in sync because mm. this is what saint paul says you know being in sync is a kind of love so the kinds of erotics indeed of being in sync you know with with each other and feel that you're doing the right thing to go out of this temple that doesn't even have doors because they don't like places that are compartmentalized they like breathing it's about implicating the outside and the inside you know it's this flow that is you know connecting breathing bodies to to space to the city to the amazon rainforest and back right this flow and that you can actually go out of this temple and deal with the indeterminacies of, of, of life. And it's a, it's a powerful orchestration, you know, of what is to be in Brazil in the 1990s. Yeah. I was wondering if perhaps we might broaden the discussion a little bit to think about, yeah, the politics of respiration, the forms of politics that are prevalent in Brazil and elsewhere. And I specifically, you know, regarding the pandemic, which we've all experienced over the past um, year and a half, as well as 
in the context of climate change, I, I, it would seem to me that people are much more aware of the fact that we can't take breathing for granted, that there's something about the way in which it's structured or conditioned that's interesting. And in particular, I was thinking of um, Franz Fanon's analysis. In the 1950s, he talked about how in places like Algeria, at that point, still um, under colonial rule, French colonial rule, how the the life of those who are colonized, their daily pulsation, um, it's not a liberatory act. It's not an act of inhabiting vitality, but it's something that he called combat breathing. And so I was just interested to ask you about how we can think of your story in Brazil from the 1990s, especially onwards in the context of, uh, say, Fanon's idea of breath that is never really self-evident or obvious. It's always shaped by power. It's um, something that under conditions of occupation, he understood as being constricted or artificial. So I'm just curious to ask you, how might, how might we broaden that story of breath and its relationship to power. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. So it's again part of the power of of breath, of breathing, is that it gives you the illusion of that naturalness, right? Mm -hmm. That actually there's no power there. Whereas it's precisely the opposite. The reason why you actually think that it's because it is already inscribed in a structure of power, right? It's not outside of power, but it's... Mm -hmm. All the more. Yes. Right? And so, you know, charismatics sometimes they... I heard this several times, you know, that uh, they would sometimes speak of supernatural and supernatural. That is to say, supernatural as spiritual, divine, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but supernatural as... A natural that could not be more natural, mm -hmm. and the superlative for natural. And then they would say, you know, and technology, it's what allows you to, to make the superlative natural, you know, that it will hone that. They would see technology not as indeed a mediation, but as an extension of a process that is already natural, which is breathing, mm -hmm. which is like, we are like this machine as well. It's a mechanics, it's mm -hmm. a doing. Mm -hmm. Because the Byzantine Rosary, it's also about this repetition, it's highly technical process. So they're very conscious of this idea that there is indeed power is there, you know. It's almost this Foucauldian idea, you know, that power, the, the question is like, uh, it's not, whether there is power or not, but what are the creative aspects of power? That's the question. And, and it's interesting because you would think they would make this separation between, you know, the natural and the technological, but there was an absolute comfort with these things. You yeah. Know? Also brings to mind how many people these days, especially fairly well-off professionals, they use apps to regulate breathing, to meditate. And so there seems to be no contradiction between using a highly controlled technology like your iPhone to inhabit a space so-called outside of technology. So it's interesting how the technological means are, they are rendered invisible at the same time as, as you're saying there, uh, you could argue that they're the extension of themselves. Absolutely. This is indeed uh, what I experienced in talking, and not just with those who are, you know, involved in mentoring the coaches, like the Padre Marcelo, he really, literally gives the masses with a whistle, you know, like he's, he's a trainer of souls, he calls himself. Right? He was a bodybuilder before he became a priest. And so this sense that, that there's a technique, a technique that it's there, you know, when you pray the Byzantine Rosary, again, it's very important. They also call it ejaculatory. It's, you know, it's very important, the idea of symmetry, that you use the same amount of air to inhale as to exhale, you know, this idea of symmetry. So songs, all these songs are composed. It's not any words. It's, it's really about thinking the economy of, of breathing that it's there, you know. So you build songs as if according to this matrix of, of symmetry of breathing. And you're singing this, you know, you're really building this 
tower of air that often ends up in speaking in tongues as the kind of the ultimate implosion of any referential meaning. You know, before already, it's about just repetition of these words that don't mean much. I love Jesus. Jesus loves me. I love Jesus. Jesus. You lose the meaning that is there. And normally this leads to this moment of speaking in tongues, which is this complete articulation of the air, right? It's an air that speaks itself. When you speak in tongues, you say nothing in particular, or you say everything and say nothing at the same time, right? So, but to get to that point, they're very aware that they need this kind of building up, you know, and they need this technique and that they are a scaffold, a scaffold of, of this tower of, the, they often say Pentecost actually is the opposite of the Tower of Babel, because in Pentecost, they all spoke different languages and yet they understood each other. And Babel, they were speaking one and the same language, but could not understand each other. So it's like Babel inverted. Actually, architecture is a, as an important kind of metaphor in their world. So in other words, you know, there's never this consciousness that the technique is not part of it. And not the least because of the, you know, charismatics themselves. For example, the runner of this very big media corporation that is a charismatic priest that started this with these 12 people that followed him like as if they were the, the apostles. What we constantly see on TV is these very self-referential logics, which is they take us to the studios of this media corporation to say, look, we now get, got this microphone, look how it works. And look at this, uh, you know, new um, recording studio. You know, so, so while they are talking about the powers of the spirit, they're always showing you the machine they are using constantly. It's interesting because on the one hand, your story is built on a kind of mobilization of something that's invisible and almost abstract, the spirit and breath too, though one can regulate it, one can manage it, one can master it, it, it also has a certain kind of self-effacement. And it's what's so interesting about your book is that um, in their own practices, they're constantly making visible the infrastructure. Like breathing itself, we used to forget that we breathe. It's now also with COVID that we are becoming aware of that we were these breathing beings before we are anything else. And they do exactly that. As with breathing, they make it, you know, explicit what was implicit. They, as Peter Sloterdijk would say, you know, you explicate breathing. You know, it has now this underlying structure. I mean, Lucy Rigaret is, is a big critic to Martin Heidegger. The forgetting of air in Martin Heidegger is all about that. She's making a feminist critique that earth is for her. Men as, as women are for air. Why? Because air, you forget about it, right? It's the, the force, the entity that is there serving, you know, but because it's so vital, what it does that you can forget about it. And in fact, she participates in her own forgetting, right? And, and what charismatics exactly do is indeed to constantly show you the background, you know, the infrastructure that it's there. And it's very interesting to think how that deals with the the question of critique as our last question you know i think your book offers a really um really important diagnosis of the mechanics of power of of um also subjectivity in brazil but if we were to think um about the possibilities of critique using using your diagnosis what would be your thoughts yeah, so I think in, let's say, modern terms, modern critique has been about, you know, this idea of the hermeneutics of suspicion, right? That uh, to be critical is to go beyond appearances and discover the structures that are working in the back from behind. Right. So, so our position is that whatever it's there, it's opaque. Mm -hmm. There's power working behind it. And my role here is going to be to render visible what those powers that are operating in the background. Here in this case, and we have to think about, again, this, they are Catholic Pentecostals. So adopting methodologies that are associated with Pentecostals. But the Pentecostals themselves, they have been fraught by scandals and of right. corruption. So they say, look, while we use 
media like Pentecostals do, we are not as corrupt. Look, as a matter of fact, we constantly show you the background, right? And so what you have here is is actually an option for transparency. Mm -hmm. But the question you need then put is that how much transparency hides more than it shows? Right. To what extent, you know, things can suffer from an excess of, of visibility or, or how they can hide in the hypervisible, right? And so, and so what this sh shows us, you know, it's not like some people say that it's the end of ideology or so on, because this hermeneutics of suspicion or this idea of the separation between a background and a foreground is no longer there. I think ideology now has a different distribution, you know, it distributes itself in a different way. And I think it's actually way more dangerous because what they are saying now is also, look, how can you criticize me if I'm already criticizing myself, right? So there's a question of autoimmunity that it's here mm -hmm. that actually puts you in a very awkward position because if indeed, and this I think Lyotard has mentioned this before, the capacity of capitalism to laugh about itself, that actually puts you, you know, makes all your attempts at laughing at capitalism desperately redundant because capitalism is already criticizing itself. And that's from where it draws its power, you know, yeah. and leaves you without knowing, you know, where are you going to position yourself? Right. Because it creates this kind of self referential mm -hmm. logic. Mm -hmm. And this is something also that, like breath and its circulation, you know, and it's auto self referential again, you mm. know, shows that this circular topology is also a form of engaging with critique or a form of actually preempting or living it out, mm. you know. I think we'll end here. Thank you very much, Maria Jose, for speaking to me. We've been speaking about your recent book, The Charismatic Gymnasium, published by Duke University Press in 2021. Thanks very much. Thank um, you. Okay. Pleasure. <laughs> Many thanks for joining us on another episode of Diálogos Messila. I would like to thank Professor Ajay Gandhi, Senior Fellow of Messila in 2021 and Assistant Professor at Leiden University, and Maria José de Abreu, Assistant Professor at Columbia University. Maria José's book, The Charismatic Gymnasium, Breath, Media and Religious Revivalism in Contemporary Brazil, published by Duke University Press, is already available. Check out our blog, Global Convivial Forum, for an extra part of this interview, in which Ajay Gandhi and Maria José de Abril discuss in more detail the crafting of bodies by religious actors and the politics of respiration in Brazil and elsewhere. Just go to mesila.net slash blog. Diálogos Mesila is a production of the Maria Zibela Merrin Center Conviviality and Equality in Latin America. Our team in São Paulo is formed by Jörg Klenk, Joaquim Toledo Jr., Melanie Metzin, Marina Falcão Motoki, Gustavo Diniz, and Rafael Conkli. Gil Fuser does the editing and musical identity. Until next time.